you can see the screen, yes. All right, so this talk will be about BigQuery. Um, so I assume nobody knows or has used BigQuery before, so it should be fine if you have no experience with it. So uh, maybe a bit about myself first. So my name is Matthias. I work at Datatonic. In Datatonic, we do uh, a lot of big data and machine learning and visualizations. So that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm also a qualified qual uh, cloud developer. Um, and you can reach me on Twitter or at my email address, matthias.datatonic.com. So um, during this talk, what I want to do is first <coughs> do BigQuery. What is BigQuery? For, in case you have no idea what it is. Uh, then go a little bit deeper in how it works, mm -hmm. how it scales. Then a small comparison to all the tools you could use to do a bit of the same things. <coughs> then do a demo. Then going through the pricing model, because that's a bit different from all the technologies that could be uh, more related. And then finally go over some best practices. Okay, so BigQuery, if you just look it up, what you get is some long sentence saying that BigQuery is a fully managed, cloud-based, interactive query service for massive data sets. So here, the, just, the, just basically, it's a query service. It's not a database. It's not, uh, it's not a software. It's not a machine. It's just a query service, some API you could use to query data. Um, and this is on massive data sets. Um, and internally, it's it basically, if you want to look up how it works, it's an externalization of Tremel. This is one of the core technologies in Google, and they also uh, yeah, wrote papers about it, so you can find a lot more information if you look for Dremel instead of BigQuery. So if you uh, actually want to work with BigQuery, you, the, the interface you probably will see uh, is using a uh, typical web user interface. So it's like a small example on the right, showing how it would look like. Uh, but it's not the only interface. Like I said, it's an API, it's a query service, so you can interact with it using this web user interface, but also using a, just a terminal, using gcloud commands, uh, that the IP APIs directly. We also have a lot of client libraries, uh, top Python, uh, Java, and, and like a lot of languages. Uh, you have also a lot of external tools that have direct uh, communications to work with the APIs, so they're like optimized. So like in Tableau or Excel, you can use these. Um, you have also an ODPC connector that you could use. Um, in this case, it's not optimized completely for BigQuery, but everything that works with an ODPC connector you can also use directly with BigQuery. So it gives a lot of options. Um, and if you put it in, in like in, in, in space of Google Cloud Platform and different technologies you could use, um, this is a more elaborate example, basically showing like the different kind of inputs and outputs of a system you set up and where BigQuery uh, you should position it. So basically if you have some data that comes in, you have some streaming data, some batch data, uh, then the streaming data will probably go into Google Cloud Platform <coughs> using PubSub. Uh, batch data will just be uploaded to Cloud Storage. And then you probably have this data flow block here, actually taking these two uh, different components, the batch and the streaming, into account and transforming it to push it into BigQuery. Um, note that you can also just push these things directly into BigQuery, but then you of course depend on the format that these uh, messages look like. So Dataflow would just look like to uh, optimize the structure and to get some pre-processing before you dump it into BigQuery. And from BigQuery you have lots of options. So like I said, you have lots of integrations, so you could use DataLab to do click view, uh, you have like all of these options. Uh, you could also use Dataproc, this basically to run Spark or Hadoop in Google Cloud Platform, um, and that's the gist of it. Big table is just to get very fast, uh, very fast access to, uh, to to query things, but you can't you can just ask for an ID and then it will return an item. You can't do ad hoc queries like in BigQuery. So BigQuery is more like to do analyzes. Big table then is more like uh, just give me all the information from this ID and then you get this information like really in a millisecond instead of a few seconds. So that was a small introduction of what BigQuery is, so how you would use it. Um, now I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper into how it scales or how it works internally. So you get an idea of uh, the things you can do or how to like not optimize it really, but just get a good idea about it. So like I said, it's an externalization from Dremel. 
um, if you want to go really deep in how BigQuery works, there's a complete paper here uh, published in 2010, you can look it up, then you get a full overview. And I'll just go over the architecture real quick here, just to get the basic ideas behind it. Basically, you can split it up in two parts. Uh, the first part is the data model, then the second part is the, the, the query execution. So the data model, basically the core idea here is it's columnar storage. So instead of using records to store the data, you store it by column by column. Um, you also have the concept of nested and repeated fields. Um, so you can have, like instead of one row, which have the thing appearing once, you can have some items that are repeated or like nested, some, some kind of JSON representation in each row. And if you do a query, there is no index. So you don't optimize anything, it's just put it in there, and everything that you read will basically be written uh, from, uh, from this directly. So it's every time a full table scan. So yeah, it gives you some, I mean, it means you can't optimize anything, but since it's shared among different machines, it's really fast. Um, then the query execution, here the concept is you work with a tree architecture, so you have one machine getting requests, and a lot of machines actually in a tree to, uh, to help uh, serve the answer, and it's using the, yeah, the fast Google network to get all the data going through it. Um, so if I go a little deeper about the columnar storage, so basically yeah, I get to get the idea of columnar storage, is another way of representing it. So uh, with, within one column, uh, there are some benefits for this. So first of all, since we are working with really big data sets from Olympic query, it helps to reduce the number the data that you read. Since a typical query won't be reading all the columns, you just have like a few columns in your query. So if you store it in a way that you'll store query, uh, sorry, column by column, um, you don't have to read all the columns at once. This reduces the number of data that actually are querying. It also allows for much higher compression ratios. So basically, if you know what kind of data that's in there, you know the range of things, then it's easier to compress it on a much higher level. So completely here, they say that in the paper they mentioned something like going from a factor of one to three in a, a record-based uh, record compression to the factor one to 10 with a column by column of compression. Um, the figure on the right just shows you like it's really factor of 10 actually increase by going from uh, from record data to column data. And then the three architecture will just go over it real quick to see like uh, how it will look like if you take a, uh, an example query. So basically you start at, uh, at the root server, oh, start at, uh, just looking at the figure, uh, start at the root server just one machine, this is the machine you will be communicating with, so you are the client and sending a query to the root server. It's, this root server will just get the query, then look up the, the table metadata. The only thing this one will do is just send out new queries. But it will be queries to more machines using the metadata to see like, let's say you just want the average temperature of the last 10 years, then this uh, root server will say, okay, I see that the data, uh, you ask the temperature of the whole data set, so the root server will see, okay, the data set contains data for 10 years, so in the next level I just query uh, each machine of each intermediate server should query uh, one year. Then in these intermediate servers they do just the same things. So they get the query, they say okay I have to query this for one year. Uh, one year is 12 months, so I'll just push it to my intermediate level uh, servers that are need, so each has one month and so on. And then it, uh, finally you get to the leave servers at the end. This can be thousands of machines actually getting these parts, and then they will just do the table scan for their part. So it is this have this chunk of data that they have to read. So then they read it all in parallel. Then they go up. So then you go up again, go to the intermediate servers, like the last layer of them. Then they do this aggregation, but they can do it in parallel. So you have a lot of machines actually doing parallel aggregation, so which makes it really fast. <coughs> then go up and up. Just the same thing until you get into the root server, which then sends the data to the clients. So this way you can have a lot of uh, machines running for a few seconds to do to handle a lot of big data. Uh, the problem is with this kind of architecture, uh, it's not made for like just dumping data. So if you do a query and say, "I want the whole data set, just give it to me," 
then it, all the data will have to go to this root server. So with BigQuery, the idea is really to have like this query and make BigQuery work for it and just give a small data back. Not to just give all the data back. Um, there are some things you could use to have multiple root servers to just distribute the work. But typically, we just want BigQuery to do the hard stuff to get, uh, to get through all, all of the big data and just turning a small part that's already allocated for you. Okay, so that was uh, so a bit about how it scales. So now I'll want to make a small comparison to these two other options you could use to handle uh, big data. So the first one is a NoSQL data source. So typically with NoSQL data source, what you don't have is, is like it's, it's, it's index based. So you actually have to define what should go into the index. And if you query it on this index, it will really fast because like in memory, it will return uh, really good results, really fast results for these queries that are like where it's optimized for. The big query, you don't have this. So basically, uh, it allows to do like any kind of question. You don't have to think about which index to build because it doesn't, you don't have it. Um, and it's just fast because it's using more machines for a small amount of time. Um, with NoSQL data source, what's been changing now is like in data store normally, you, and then in NoSQL you always have these read writes, you can change, update things. Um, this wasn't the case in BigQuery a few months ago. Right now they're also making it fully SQL compliant, and you, will, and you are actually able now, it's in beta still, to update records. So previously you would stack only append. So you would like have more, tip, more versions of the same thing if you want to update it. Um, so that will be something to take into account because you can't update it, you always have this one column that says which version is this and every time you make a new version you just say okay this is an incremental version of this. So if you would query it, it would also make more difficult queries but you still have the backlog. Uh, but that's changing also now. So it will be more similar and so the, basically the only difference would be that it's not in the next page. So it allows to do queries really more at home. So if you compare it to like more MapReduce kinds of uh, things or even for Dataflow, basically uh, the biggest difference is that with BigQuery, uh, the focus is on, uh, on low latency to get really interactive queries. So you, you ask something and it should return in seconds. If you have some kind of MapReduce job, you would expect at least some minutes to return data. So if you want something really quick to like just ask it, then you would use BigQuery to get these low latency results. What kind of MapReduce like style of algorithms uh, of programs more allow, of course, is that it's um, it's more flexible. So you just program what you should do. You don't know what the structure of the data is. You can just program it, and then it will return something. With BigQuery, it's SQL-like queries. Also now in beta, it's more actual SQL. Um, so it's structured to you know what you can work with, but there are some limitations. Um, so it's in the same kind of idea here. Since it's like more flexible and this is SQL, this one works with unstructured data, the other ones, BigQuery is only for structured data. So typically you would have like this kind of data flow or map reduce steps pushing like unstructured data into, into, into BigQuery to get the structured data. And then you can just query it using standard SQL queries. Okay, so after uh, just make a small comparison, I will just do a small demo of showing how it looks. Um, before I do my own demo, but I'll just go over it. This is a quick example showing the performance of BigQuery on a really massive data set. Uh, that's also available in BigQuery samples. And this data set, uh, they just do a quick uh, a query using uh, data expressions. So typically, if you would query something with a where statement, you would have maybe an index in there, so it's, it's performant to do that really fast. Uh, but indexes and regular expressions is not that good a match. So that's showing the power of BigQuery. You don't have to think about optimizing something with an index. So regular expressions also work as fast as if there wouldn't be an index as well. Uh, so in this specific example, the query is um, show the number of views for each language uh, with this title containing something with yeah, Google with, a, with a four regular expressions, uh, with four uh, alt cards, and group this by language in order to find the number of views it has. Um, the number of data that, the data that it queries here is like four terabytes, so it's really big. 
and it should, uh, like you saw, it should have turned something in 25 seconds. Um, so this shows you how fast it scales. Um, the nice thing also is if it's, it doesn't scale linearly the time it needs. So basically if you would have uh, 400 gigabytes, it wouldn't take it wouldn't go 10 times as fast, or it wouldn't go 10 times as slow now because it's 10 times as big. Uh, so it just takes some time, but it's not like there's a linear relationship between the query time and the data sets. So if you have really small data sets, it's also taking a few seconds. But if it scales, then it scales faster. Okay. So now I'll just show... Uh, I'll just go over the interface, the web user interface, to show like different parts in there and how you could work with it. So, open this. So this is how it looks like, the, the interface, if it's loading. Um, okay. So I have a few parts here. So if you open it, it's like really bad resolution, of course. You can see the, the project that you're in. So in Google Cloud Platform, you have the concept of a project. A project is something that contains the, the building, the persons who have access to it. It's all contained in a project. So you can see the project name in there. And then you can see the different data sets that are available in BigQuery for this project. So here I just have this test data sets. Uh, and I actually don't have any tables in there, but basically if I would have a data set, so if I scroll a bit down, these are just data set. You could also put in there some public data sets. So I have uh, public data, which is also a data set. So right now it's, it's a project, another project. Um, and the data set samples. If you click on that, then you can see all the different tables that are available here. Um, then you can just click on, on a table here. And it shows up all the information knows about the table. So basically you get the table, um, the first one is just the schema, so it just shows you all the different columns that are available, uh, the different types of the different columns, you can put in there if it's a repeated field, if it's a query, if it's notable, uh, and also some, I could just put some text in there that explains uh, what the column is about. So that's the first thing that you will see if you just open BigQuery, okay, I'll try to, well, Okay, so that's the first one. The, the next thing is the details. So basically it gives also text, you can also change it, what's in there. Then some metadata about the tables, so the number of, sorry, the data that's in there, the, how many gigabytes, the number of rows, uh, the creation dates, the modification dates, and the location. Um, and then the final tab here is just a preview. So if you would query it, uh, I mean, you don't have to query it to see the data, you can also click on preview, then you get just a small snippet of what's in, in the BigQuery table. So, uh, this is what's in here. So it looks something like this. So, and then you could just click on query table to actually make your query. Um, click on schema. So. So I can make a really simple query saying select the different years in here. So I just do years. And then there's also autocomplete. So if you type something, you put push tab, then you can see the possible uh, uh, columns in there. Oh, sorry. Oh, columns or functions. So here is also a function of a timestamp. So I'll just use column year. Um, yeah, I'll just do this thing here. Um, and it's. Uh, so you can put any query in there, and maybe you put the mean temperature, so it is average of mean. Oh. mean temperature, then group by year. limits. Then uh, typically also use this format query just to get a nice, nicer overview of what's in there. It's really helpful if you get more complex query. Um, okay, then we can just run this. And uh, 
It's also showing some information here. So basically, you all see this kind of validator here, so which is green now because it's a valid query. If I would like change the query bits, then it shows you like uh, if it's not valid. So it's saying helping you figure out what's going wrong here. Uh, so that's really helpful. And if it's correct, then it also show you before you run it how much data you will process. So this amount of data is not really that relevant. But sometimes you can make some mistakes, and if you're querying terabytes or petabytes of data, that's quite useful to know before you run the query how much data you actually query. Uh, okay. So then you just just get the results here. Um, the results. Uh, damn it. Uh, resolution is really not cool. Uh, so if you get the results, you can just yeah get this from this interface. You can download them as CSV or as JSON, or you can just make a new table from this. So I will just click here, save as table. So I have this data set called uh, tests. Then I say okay. Then and get the table here with the results. So that's how you could work with it. Uh, there are lots of other options here as well. If you click on show options, uh, show options, you can uh, see some things you can change. Uh, for instance, you might think the biggest one that you should know is that BigQuery, like I said, it's it's optimized to get to return small amounts of data, querying lots of data. So uh, if you don't want to have a small data set returns, uh, you will probably reach some limit to say, okay, this, this data is too much. Um, then you have to specify, uh, okay, allow big data sets. And to do that, you probably have to first make a table to show to where uh, you want to write data. So I can just put in some test two. Um, and if you say that it's writes to a table, then you can just specify allow large results. And this way it will be able to uh, process any amount of data you want. But typically, if you don't select this, it will say it's bigger than 128 megabytes, it's too big. Uh, I don't think this makes sense. So you first have to allow the specified table to write to, and then also uh, allow large results. Okay, so that was a small demo. So next is a pricing model, which is a really interesting because it's quite different from typical other kind of query services if you can find some. Uh, basically the storage, uh, the cost there is, consists of two parts. The first one is just the storage cost. So they completely decouple the, the query service from the storage service. So just <laughs> storing it costs two cents per gigabyte per month. Um, and if it's old data that's not changing, so if you have a table in there that's like more than 90 days old, then the price even drops one cent. So basically putting data in BigQuery is as cheap, or sometimes even cheaper than just storing it on disk somewhere else. But if you put it in BigQuery, you can also just query it, so that's nice. And then the actual query cost, so it only when you query it, uh, you pay for the amount of data you query. So this amount of data that you query is based on the columns you selected. So if you don't select all the columns, you also don't have to pay to query all these columns. This price is five dollars uh, per terabyte, and the first terabyte is free. Uh, free. Yes. The amount of data processed or the amount of data returned? Data uh, processed. Uh, data uh, actually that's on on any the table there. Uh, any other questions about this? Or? No? Okay. So, okay, then we'll uh, go over the best practices. So the first one, uh, like I said, the BigQuery has this concept of a nested than repeated fields, and it's also something that you should use in BigQuery, because you can do joins in there, like a relational database, but it's not optimized to do that. It's actually optimized to have really big tables, contain lots of columns. Uh, so you have lots of columns in there, it doesn't really matter if you use them or not because uh, you only pay if you use them or if you query them and if some columns just contain nulls there's also, they don't, don't count, they don't take up any space so it typically have really big tables with lots of columns in there um, so also if you have these big tables 
they allow you to have this nested representation, nested fields. Um, and I'll, I'll give a small introduction of like this example here. So in a typical relational database design, you would have something like this. So have a people table containing uh, different people, and then you have a link with the cities lived in. So then you have this relationship showing this uh, one-to-many relationship. So you have these two separate tables. You could also have this denormalized format in which you just have uh, one line per combination of person, a people, and the cities lived in. Then you have a lot of uh, repeti uh, repetitions of this name, age, and gender. So that's also not really optimal. Um, so with BigQuery, you probably have something like this, the nested repeated JSON. Um, so and where you just have one row containing one name, one age, one gender. And then a repetition of records containing just the city and the years lived. So that's something you can do. And you yeah, call, call it pre-join or something. So it's like uh, you still have options to work with it the way you want. Um, it's also nice if you query it. So let's say you just want to query and find out the different names in the table. In the, in the table. Then you can just query names. And let's say that every person has five cities lived in. Then instead of having to uh, go over the data of these uh, five cities lived in and one million persons, then instead of going over five million records, you just have to go over this one million records. And if you want to query something uh, to find out only the people who lived in a specific city, then you go over all the data. So this allows you to, uh, to reduce query cost as well. So then the next one is uh, table partitioning. So you pay for what you read. So the query costs are expressed as <coughs> the data you process, but basically it's just what's in the tables. Um, but there's no index in there, so you actually have to read the whole table, not all the columns, but all the records. So in, in the BigQuery, what they typically do is table partitioning. So instead of having one big table with all the data, with all the rows in there, you just have a lot of tables with different, uh, different records in there. Uh, so that can be maybe a bit counterintuitive, uh, but basically what BigQuery has allowed is the same, you can query the table as well. So you can specify a query that defines which tables you want to query. So instead of if for this dates, you can have like one table for each day, then you can use this table date range function uh, with the begin timestamp and end timestamp, and it will return all the tables, uh, or it will read the data and all the tables that are between these dates. Uh, the same thing for for other kinds of partitions. So if you don't partition by date, let's say you have different machines and you have one table per machine, then you can also query it and say, uh, basically you can put anything in a query there to query the table names. So this can be a regular expression, can, can be any kind of yeah, statement that you can make to find the tables you want. So that allows you to give a lot of flexibility in the data you want to read. This way you can reduce the amount of data you're actually reading. Uh, what's nice is that now they also have these date partition tables uh, directly. So previously you would have to use this kind of table date range functions to work with table date ranges. Uh, now they also allow to do this automatically. If you have some data that's streaming in, then they will record it in a special uh, column just containing the data, the time that the date was the data was put in there. So you can just query directly and you only pay for the data you actually read. Um, since there are still the two options, you can also easily switch from one to the other. Um, also another benefit of table partitioning is that this pricing that reduces from two cents to one cent a month is also based on each partition. So if you have this kind of concept in which you have one partition per day, then it's automatically, if it, the data is 90 days old, then you won't touch it again, then it will be half, uh, half the price. Okay. Uh, then another one is uh, optimize for query versus storage cost. So in the query you have two cost layers, so one is just storage cost and the other one is query costs. Uh, with a common concept is basically have very large data sets but some people need to have an update every every minute or something or they want some something in between uh, so 
if you would optimize for, I mean, if, one way to do this would just just dump this query and read all the data over and over again. Uh, that's not the recommended way to do it. What you typically want to do is have this kind of material views, materialized views, which means that you have just tables that you create every day or update every day um, that contain uh, already summarized data. So, um, so for instance, if you have um, sales that you want to see, a uh, table of sales over the last 30 days, or something like that, you can typically just make a table containing not the item level details, but just a table containing the sales by hour or sales by day. So and this could be something that you just update every day. That's one way, just to make, uh, based on the, the lowest level data, just make this kind of new table, so this is called a materialized view. Another way is just, like if you use Dataflow, instead of running into one table, running into multiple tables at the same time. So you could write all the data to like a daily table, saving, um, or maybe just like an item table, so showing the, the sales for each item separately. You can also have in the same data flow job something that writes aggregated to another table already. So then you have like you have more data in there because it's like you have a different kind of aggregation of the data, but it's much cheaper of course because if you query it, uh, yeah, if you query lesser data, it will be much cheaper. So that's something typical in BigQuery as well. You just have a lot of tables there. Um, then also, a very straightforward one is don't use Nextstar. It's really simple. Um, you just have to think about it and take it into account. If you use Nextstar, it's just costly because you have lots of columns, you won't use it. You can just use the preview button just to get an idea of what's in there, but you don't have to use this Nextstar if you don't need it. Um, then another one is table decorators. So you could use table partitions to reduce the amount of data you read. Another way to reduce the amount of data you read is I mean, the only other way to reduce the amount of data that you read from a specific table is to use this kind of uh, table decorators. And this uh, just gives you some snapshots up to seven days ago of the table of the data that was in there. And it allows you to do stuff like, okay, give me the data, the table from yesterday. They won't pay for the data that's been added today. You could also say, give me the data that was added uh, today. So you say, give me the difference between what was written in there yesterday and today. And then you only pay for the parts of the table that was added today. Um, and also, really nicely, allows you to, to uh, undelete tables. So you can do you run this query. Say, give me this table from yesterday, and even if you have deleted it, you can still query it. And that's uh, up to seven days in the past. Uh, then another one is query optimizations. Uh, maybe I can also show you the, 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 the same thing. So if you if you run the query, you have the results. There are also a few tabs in there. One of them is explanation. And uh, like I said, it's a hierarchical execution. Or is this like kind of tree that's formed? You have in the tree multiple levels or multiple stages. Basically, these explanations show you for each stage the different times it took to execute this this query. So you have this um, this number showing how much of the time it was waiting, how much it was just reading, how much it was doing computations, and how much it's doing right. So you can give this overview and it will show you like uh, how well the data was distributed among the different nodes. So showing you the darkest color, you probably you can't see it. The darkest color is showing like how uh, long it took for the for the biggest one, or for the, the largest chunk. You also have the average time. Then you can easily see here um, where the computation is taking a lot of time. So in case it would, would uh, not be optimal, then you can go in there. And then you could do stuff like uh, grouping in multiple steps, for instance, if you say, uh, give it for every uh, every postcode. You can first say give it for every country, so it's like more distributed and stuff like this. So you can can uh, answer the explanation, and then you get these kind of insights that you can use to further optimize your query. But the pricing will be the same, uh, since basically you're reading the same amount of data. Then the final thing I wanted to show here was a uh, user-defined functions. 
So if you want to do something fancy with your query, uh, you have uh, with your data you have two f options. You either use something like Dataflow to process the data and BigQuery to do some kind of uh, yeah, just some function calls or to do some calculations or some manipulation that you can't do in standard SQL. Uh, BigQuery also allows to use JavaScript functions, so you can basically put in there any kind of library, uh, JavaScript library in there to use to uh, to work with your data. And how it works is as um, you have a function that takes into uh, just takes one row in there, and then you just have this row of data that you can do anything with. So then you can have uh, just you have JavaScript, and you can uh, just transform some parts of it. You can also have multiple outputs, so you have this one row, so it's always just working with one row, but then you can have multiple outputs or zero outputs or, or just one output, and you can handle it in a way that you want. So this is uh, this allows you to like do small things that you don't require any data flow or MapReduce functions to process it, but do it directly into uh, to BigQuery. So that was it for my presentation. Uh, yeah, I can also show a bit more. I thought I would have like less time. <laughs> um, okay. So not sure if there are any questions or no. The thing is, getting the data in is the complicated thing. No, no, it's not. So I'll just show you how to put the data in there. I mean, massive data. Sorry. Massive amount of data. So if you have big data sets that you want to put in into BigQuery, sorry, I'll just close this. Like one petabyte. Uh, yeah. So you won't be you won't be doing it in one step. So you will first put it into cloud storage or in Google Cloud Platform, and from there on you will put it into uh, BigQuery. Is there any thing like Amazon has, like you know, these spots? You know, yeah, you can also be... yes. So, but it's not for. So I'm not sure what's the correct name for that, but you can also have to send the disk to somewhere in Google and then they put it in cloud storage uh, and then you can like easily put it into BigQuery. Uh, it's a huge amount of data so it will take maybe months to... No, no, no. If you use for instance Dataflow, uh, what we have done is like uh, we had a client that had like I uh, think 2 billion rows for each day uh, that they are using right now. They had a backlog of a few, like almost a year. So then they send some physical disk to Google. So Google just pushes it somewhere in cloud search. Then we use Dataflow to have like 1,000 machines that just push things to BigQuery. Yeah. Any way to connect to an existing, like uh, an ATAP appliance of two petabytes? Sorry? It, uh, if, you, if we have a connection which is fast enough, can, can't we use that so that the data is to move to, to directly put it into BigQuery from yeah. uh, um, But it's about like this wall full of disks. So. Ah, okay, okay. But there's somebody from Google here as well. He could maybe yeah, help uh, you to a specific. I, I, I can jump in. Um, you, can, you can connect directly to, to Google Cloud if you want. So it's mean, fiber? Or? Uh, using fiber, yeah. That's cloud, uh, there are three different ways to connect to Google Cloud. One is the one that we all know, the public internet. Yeah. Then you have career internet. Which is you go to, for example, a, a Verizon A3. You you connect to a one provider that is guaranteeing you some bandwidth, and then you don't go through the public internet. You go to these providers. This provider is guaranteeing you a certain amount. Because of this is a huge uh, net up thing. So exactly. Exactly. We don't and want to move that one. And then there is the possibility of connecting directly to Google Cloud, which is something that you can do as well. But typically, that's recommended for huge customers with huge demands of moving information around. So that's yeah. not something that you do for a one-time transfer of information. Mm -hmm. For that, it's the, it's called offline import, uh, offline import, uh, import of data. That basically, you get your, this, your, you get your disk, you encrypt yeah, yeah. it, and you send it. Well, we get new sets daily, so. Sorry? We get new data sets daily to this thing, so. Uh, in that case, then, yes, there, there are connections. Well, I can show you afterwards, so you can maybe tell me. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? You can only put data through Dataflow? Or no, 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 you can also directly put, uh, upload it. So, checking if I can show. So, basically, it's a really simple interface. So, oh, come on. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So if 
go here, you can just click. Uh, the resolution is there. So if you click plus, ah, no. Okay. 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 So basically, this is what you do. You say, okay, add a new table. Then you get this interface saying, okay, where's location? I say Google Cloud Storage. You can also just upload it from here. Uh, so then you specify where the location is of the file. Then you say what is the format. So is it JSON, is it off row, or is it data store backup? Um, then you say, okay, it should be written through this table. Then you just type the name, table name. And you have these options here as well. Um, so I didn't talk about this, but basically you could write something to a native table, so it writes to BigQuery, but you can also have just a link in there. So you can have any CSV file or something, uh, based in Cloud Storage or even on Google, uh, Google Drive, which you can yeah, just update as well. And you can also query it, uh, reading it directly from that file. But you will typically just say native table, then it will make this table from the data that you have specified, then you just specify uh, the column from the schema here. Just a few options here. Then just create table and you have the table. Is there any special thing to do to have access to these BigQuery features? No, uh, no if you just go to cloud.cool.com and then sign up, you have a free sign up. Then you get $300 and you can just yeah. play with it. Okay. Alright, that was a BigQuery.